Let us pray. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand that understanding we may believe and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Scripture reading this morning is Psalm 47. A simple psalm, a simple sermon, well, yes, the first half, I'll manage to make it complicated just to thrill you. I don't know if I'm raising or lowering expectations when I say things like that, but Psalm 47. Catch it the first time through. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with cries of joy, for the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises, for God is the King over all the earth. Sing to Him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on His holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham, for the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Well, this is also Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday in the Christian liturgical year. A long year has gone by, a long wait for God to come in Advent, a sustained time of mourning and lowly exile with Israel here. The joy of Christmas, seasons along the way, the agony of the cross, the surprise at Easter, the descent of the Spirit. A celebration that we see on this day is to be a simple and unreserved exaltation. And we're invited to join in. The throng around the throne, clapping, shouting, singing. Well, there, that's Psalm 47. But you know I'm going to mess with it. Friends, the Psalms have been ordered. It's good to know. If you want to make your study serious, think about these things. Someone, probably long ago, long after the writing, placed the 150 psalms into five unevenly sized books, and within the books arranged the individual psalms, each one. That's a collection. And these five collections are themselves probably based on some earlier collections. David's psalms here, Asaph's psalms there, Further, maybe not quite as obvious, individual psalms seem to be precisely placed. Yes, Psalm 1 introduces all that follows. You know, I believe that. Psalm 150 sums up all that has gone before. And further still, maybe less obvious still, within the five books are clusters of psalms. These are alike, and these are alike, and these are on the same theme, and these even sound perhaps, well, if we were to know how to sing them, they would even sing alike. Psalm 120 to 134 go together as psalms of ascent up toward Jerusalem. Psalms 145 to 150, an accumulative crescendo for all the whole collection. Psalm scholars think that they have detected such things, collections and clusters and pairings. It's an art more than a science, to be sure. They behold and they consider more than they announce settled results when they're at their best. But when they detect such things, they rightly ask what now can be learned that considering these psalms only a part, we might have missed. So let's start there. Psalm 47, between 46 and 48, produces this kind of wonder at their combination and has promoted and prompted such learning. A cluster of three, if you will. Psalm 46, perhaps one of your favorites, God is our refuge and strength. Think a mighty fortress is our God. 
who will help the city of God when the nations are in uproar. God is within her. Psalm 48, the third, there we are again in the city of God, the city of the great king, where God has already shown himself to be her fortress. And Psalm 47, sandwiched in between, does not mention the city, but we can see clearly that that's where we are. It doesn't need to say it. We are there in the city. We came to it. We go from it. We. God has entered the city of God and is now within her. Psalm 46, where, where we are. We're invited to come out of the city, actually, and to see what God has done on the face of the earth, the desolations he has wrought. God has, did anybody see this one coming? God has made wars to cease. Don't just hear the report of it. Go check it out. Come and see, invites Psalm 46. That's the first one. And again, the third one. We'll be goaded there to bear witness to all the next generations of what we ourselves have witnessed. 46, come and see. 48, tell the next generation. 47 in the middle, celebrate it. This is just not a term report after some time in the library. This is joy. See what God has done. 46, watch. 47, worship. 48, witness. Well, maybe all that's a bit too cute. But we're beginning to understand the psalm a bit better. Another note on the three psalm cluster. 46 has current uproar. God will help. A reference to the future. 48 is more like a history lesson. When the kings, you destroyed them. A reference to the past. 47, again, in between, then becomes the point toward which 46 looks forward and 48 looks back. It's all very tight on that sense. 46 seems to suggest and announce a victory just now won and the need to begin a celebration, the clap your hands, shout to God, sing praises of Psalm 47. And 48 seems to enjoy the remembrance, a meditation it invites us, a consideration of what you have now learned, it says, of the events that were celebrated with clapping and shouting and singing in 47, leading up to and looking back on a celebration. Are we reading these psalms now, not only in chronological order of the revealing, but in the liturgical order of worship? Reenact in 46, celebrate in 47, remember in 48. Well, maybe. We're getting closer, we're almost there. One final note on 46, 47, and 48. These things that I'm offering you now are not just the speculation of recent PhDs in Hebrew with too much time on their hands before they get their first tenured position. Or your pastor with a too long plane flight back home from the city of God and the matters of the city of God. He loves these three psalms. He seems to think these three psalms are almost one historical essay with a logical pr progression. For those of you who are Bible scholars, yes, Augustine was quick to forget the poetry of the psalms in order to be sure to get all the propositional theology out of it he could. Arguments he suggests that have logical progression, arguments that build, first are introduced and amplified and accumulate fact and effect, perhaps qualify or clarify, reiterate, simply repeat, for effect, and finally summate and conclude, 46, 47, 48. And yes, yes, I confess, one of my favorite Bible interpreters often sees too much in the Psalms, granted. He sees Christ in the commas in the superscriptions, really, and goes on at length about it. Sometimes our boy had more imagination than discipline, and he always had more theology than his Hebrew could support. Yet, isn't he right about it? Don't the ordering of these psalms suggest progression? Triumph, just now won. Exaltation, now in its midst. Memorial, soon to come. This is an ancient reading of Psalm 47. If so, the crescendo is in the middle. 47, this is it. This is the high moment, not its beginning or its sustaining end. In time, it's neither past nor future. In an aspect, it's neither anticipated nor eternal. 
Let 46 and 48 do that kind of work. 47 does the simple work of inviting, commanding us to worship. 46, we were invited to see, perhaps silently, in 48, to walk about the ramparts and consider these things, perhaps quietly. Maybe, maybe these are quiet psalms, but this one is meant to shout. In 47, we exalt. Clap, shout, sing. Those are the commands repeated over and over again. This psalm invites us to exalt. It commands us to celebrate God, the most, lie, most high God, the great king over all the earth. He is here in the midst of the city, our city, enthroned. We are before that throne now, before our God. He entered in where we have come. See what he has done. Yes, inspect his handiwork. God has made war cease. Yes, tell the next generation, God is the fortress of the fortress. But for now, for now, keep it simple. Clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands. Shout to God, shout to God, shout to God. Sing praises to our king, sing praises to our king, sing praises to our king. I would break out in song right now, but that would ruin the whole thing. We're at the simple part now. The exaltation is even in the announcement that now is the time to exalt. Friends, we have been waiting all of our lives. Are you willing to recognize that? And humanity has been waiting all of history for the moment, the precise moment, when no hesitations any longer rightly remain. No voice is any longer to be held in reserve. No shout is to be self-consciously offered. Just offered. Yes, Presbyterians, this is the moment we have always feared. <laughs> there is no longer any valid reason to be, well, I guess, to be Presbyterian about it all. The king has ascended. God reigns. God is seated on his holy throne. All the people of Abraham, it declares, have assembled. Clap, shout, sing. Don't miss the cues. Clap, shout, sing. Don't miss out. Clap, shout, sing. I'll give you your money after, Steve. <laughs> God loves Presbyterians. So God gives us help. He knows our weakness. He gives us help in the form of small celebrations here and now to prepare us. Give us an opportunity to practice. Perhaps even to begin to perfect the art of celebration. Births and birthday parties. The most important person in my life has her birthday today. And just because I've announced it, it won't be a happy one. <laughs> Weddings and their anniversaries. Wedding showers and baby showers. I, I like that order. Probably not bachelor parties. Thanksgiving meals and parades, gift exchanges, and food. That's in the Bible. Memorial services of our loved ones, the beloved of God. Days of national celebration, battles won, wars ended, heroes remembered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they can go too far. But be careful not to be too careful. Cheer when the jets roar overhead. Salute when the flag is hoisted. Shout with joy when the Marine returns from Helmand Province and she is just now reunited with her son, whose mother has been deployed for half of his life. Giggle with glee with the boy. 
And yes, care for the widow and the orphan of all of the people. Show up this Thanksgiving Eve, Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock in the chapel. We'll pack the place. We'll fill it with the praise of God for what he has done. We'll practice our celebration. Invent a day. How about the 500th anniversary of the birth of John Knox? In 1514, if we don't do it, nobody will. How about the 100th anniversary this month of the dedication of the space in which we are now worshiping? We had a big cleanup day yesterday. We're scheduling one for another 100 years from now. We think, we sh- we think, we should- we think we've got a-, a pace now about this. Jimmy Ruffin died this week. Am I the only one brokenhearted? No? Yeah. Remember all the days and for all of the reasons. Yes, the 4th of July is a day of patriotism, but is it a day of family remembrance for you or other holy, holy and holidays? Well, for me, 4th of July means more. It's the day I proposed marriage to Lois. And she said no. <laughs> really. Apparently, you have to let more than three weeks go by between when you meet someone and propose marriage. Well, Fourth of July reminds me, I've got work to do. I had work to do back then. Never to take it or her for granted. And to celebrate it all. All these celebrations here and now are rehearsals for the celebration there and then. They are not to quench our hunger or to satisfy it for celebration, but to whet the appetite. At the end of it, is that all there is? Isn't there more? Yes, celebrate a war, cease, hero, come home, but there will be another, and another parade to honor another generation of people faithful to their country. But the day will come when the parade that goes by will be led by the king. The wars have ceased. So get your practice in now. Prepare. Perfect. We're on our way to the marriage feast of the Lamb. The adoration of the crucified and risen Savior. The victorious return. The anticipated enthronement the eternal exaltation of the now and forever seated king in the midst of the city, the city of God, the city of the great king, the city in which we who celebrate will live forever. Clap, shout, sing. Got it? Simple enough? Amen. Let's pray. Help us to see more clearly that our hearts may focus more dearly. Help us to be sincere, indeed with the highest integrity, that the song that we offer contains the heart as well. Indeed contains all of us. Teach us to throw our full selves into your worship each week, each day, to practice, prepare, and begin to perfect that which we will do for all eternity, even now, in this moment. Amen.